There was a day when people were content to let the inside workings of government remain secret, confidential, and classified. But not so today. They want to know everything that's happening and everything that has happened. And they'd riot in Tokyo or demonstrate in Toronto or picket Washington for the right to know the future too. Except that they're not sure that the future is in the hands of politicians. They think the man upstairs may be looking after that. And what he might have in mind for the days ahead. Well, that's really classified. It is written. This is George Vanderman. Today, It Is Written presents Classified. There isn't a man alive who wouldn't pry the lock of the future if he could. But can he? People today are restless. They're no longer sure that the answers to our problems lies in better government. They're no longer sure that our troubles can be solved by changing political parties or installing new or younger, more honest politicians. They're wondering if our problems aren't too big and too deep and too many for any man to solve. They're fearful that we may have passed the point of no return. In fact, they're beginning to fear that the most cultured and the most privileged of our nations might soon follow the path of others whose light flared brightly for a time and then went out. Only this time, they say, it could be doomsday for the whole planet. And this apprehensiveness is not limited to those who have been watching the world go round for a long time. It's affecting younger and younger minds. Listen to this. A 13-year-old boy confided in an older friend that he was going to drop out of school and run away. He said, there's no point in trying to relate to a world that's going to blow itself up soon. Things are out of hand. There are forces too big to control, and they've been let loose. Schools aren't helping us to look at these things. School, he said, is just one big box where you learn to turn your mind off. So I'm quitting. Imagine, 13 years old. You can't always tell what's troubling young people by what they say before a camera or where they're otherwise identified. The real thoughts of these youth are often expressed only when their identity is completely concealed. David Wilkerson, for instance, of the cross and the switchblade fame, recently over a period of many months conducted surveys among what he calls the forgotten teenagers, the middle class, suburban, supposedly street teenagers who've been neglected while all the attention was focused on the ghettos and hard drugs. Now, these surveys consisted of questionnaires that he passed out to these youth. No names were signed. They were free to say what was on their hearts. And to his question, what is your number one problem, he got replies from 100,000 youth. And they all added up to three main worries. Here they are. Number one, sin in their lives, habits they couldn't overcome. Number two, how to get along with their parents. And what do you suppose the third one was? It was the future. What's going to happen to mankind, to the earth? How should we as youth feel about the horrible news that hits us whenever we open the paper? So there it is. Old and young want to know what's going to happen and where it's all leading. They want to know if there's any hope. That's why millions today are turning to the psychic world, my friend. They're turning to astrologers, to fortune tellers, to mediums, to anyone, anywhere that they think might have a key that will pry the lock of the future. But listen, you don't have to roam the world looking for the key. You don't have to pick at heaven for the right to know what's going on. You probably already have the key right in your own home. 
And the only trouble may be that you haven't figured out how to use it. And of course, I'm talking about this book, the Holy Bible, the Holy Scriptures, the Word of God. This book is the key to the future. This book gives you the broad outlines and much of the detail of what lies ahead. Can you really blame anybody but yourself if unfolding events take you by surprise? But you say, wait a minute, George Vandeman, I don't understand the Bible. I don't know how to read it. I don't understand its language. I don't know how to begin. And besides, you say, did God ever intend to let us know the future? Isn't it true that what God plans to do is, well, classified information? No, my friend, it isn't. Listen, this whole book is a communication from God to man. It's its whole purpose, is to let us know what is going on, to answer our questions. Most of the questions we're spending so much money trying to find answers for, questions about our origin, are answered right in the opening pages of the Bible. The first ten words tell us more than we've found out or ever will find out with all of our expensive ventures into space. Let me turn right back here to the signature, the very opening of the Bible, the beginning. Genesis 1, verse 1, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Just ten words, but they tell a lot. Unequivocal, straight and clear-cut. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And just a few pages further on, we can discover, if we will, why the surface of the earth is in the condition it's in. That's all right here. God isn't trying to keep anything from us. He's not trying to keep things away. Look, the prophet Amos in that little book over toward the end of the Old Testament that bears his name, and the third chapter and the seventh verse says, Surely the Lord will do nothing. Notice the promise. Surely the Lord will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And of course, the prophets have been the instrument by which this book was written. We have the information here for our use. Does that sound like keeping us in the dark? No. Listen, tell me. Did God send a flood in the days of Noah without any warning? No. No, he didn't. The world was worn for a hundred and twenty years. Did Jesus come to this earth without any word through the prophets? No, again, century after century after century they predicted his coming. Then, do you think that in our day, when the world is about to wind up, the climax of human history, that God will conceal what he's doing or what he's going to do? Never. Listen, over here in the middle of the Bible, in that book called Isaiah, the 49th chapter, verses 9, verses 9 and 10, I am God, and there is no one like me declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things which have not yet been done. You see, it is a part of God's plan to reveal the future. And he continues by challenging false gods to show their divinity by doing the same thing. Here in the 41st chapter, in the 41st chapter, verses 21 to 23, Present your case, the Lord says. Bring forward your strong arguments, the king of Jacob says. Let them bring, let them bring forth and declare to us what is going to take place. And for the former events, declare what they were, that we may consider them and know their outcome. Or announce to us what is coming. Declare the things that are going to come afterward, that we may know that you are God's. That's the test of a true God. God reveals the future. He doesn't cover it up. Jesus said over here in the New Testament, recorded in John, John, the 13th chapter and the 19th verse. John 13, 19, I am telling you before,
before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. That's the test, you see. God wants us to know what is going to happen. He doesn't want us to be surprised. But tell me, if you were the enemy of God, and you wanted people to be surprised, fatally surprised, and not ready for his return, what would you do? You'd tell people that this book isn't authentic, wouldn't you? You'd tell people it's only myth and legend, or if that didn't work, you'd tell them they can't understand it, that they aren't even supposed to understand it. You'd tell them it's classified information, wouldn't you? Well, have you ever heard any of those lines? Have you? And could you guess now in whose mind these arguments originated? But you say, Pastor Vanderman, there really are some parts of the Bible that we can't understand, that are sealed, aren't there? Well, let me ask you, do you think God would send us a communication and tell us it's, tell us it's very important and then seal it so that we can't understand it? Why should he bother to send it if it isn't going to communicate anything to us? Now, there's one exception God did say to Daniel. God did say to Daniel over here in the 12th chapter of his book, near the close of the Old Testament, and the fourth verse. He says, keep the words secret and seal the book till the time of the end. Yes, God stamped classified on a portion of the book of Daniel until the time of the end. But now in the time of the end, when it's so desperately needed, it's declassified. In fact, John, who wrote down the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, in describing the book of Daniel, he says here in the 10th chapter of Revelation and the 8th verse, he says the little book, talking about Daniel, the little book which is open. It's open now. It isn't classified anymore. And what about the book of Revelation, that last compelling, fascinating book of the Bible that so many people are interested in and attempting to probe these days, the subject of our bestsellers on every side? Listen, it's widely believed that we can't understand it. At least it has been believed until people are probing it today that we aren't supposed to understand it, that it's deep and perplexing and that its message will not yield. But the very opposite is true. It's a book especially for our time. We're supposed to understand it. To neglect to understand it could be fatal. In fact, the third verse of the first chapter of the book of Revelation says this. This is quite a revelation too. Blessed or blessed is he that readeth. And they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Tell me, how could you keep the things written in this book? How could you act upon them if you couldn't understand them? Is your, in your Bible it says, at the top of this book, it says, The Revelation of St. John the Divine. But that's a man-made title. That isn't actually correct. The book didn't originate in the mind of John. Now, all he did was to write it down. Listen to the first two verses here, preceding the third verse, which I read a moment ago. Listen, the revelation. What does the word revelation mean? That which has been revealed. See, the revelation of whom? Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Listen, to hide from his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Is that what it says? No. To show and to show doesn't mean hide, does it? Well, it looks as if we've got a work to do. It looks as if we'd better get busy. And don't be discouraged. If you haven't been able to understand the Bible, you aren't alone in that. Many people have the same problem. But evidently, it's God's plan that you should have help. You remember the story of the Ethiopian riding alone in his chariot, reading the scriptures but not understanding what he read. And then God told Philip, one of his helpers, to go and help him out. 
Now, Philip heard this man in the chariot reading from the book of Isaiah. And he said, as recorded in Acts, the 8th chapter and the 30th verse, do you understand what you're reading? Very simple, natural, courteous question. Do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian said in verse 31, well, how could I unless someone guides me? Evidently, it's God's plan that we have those who know the Word of God help those who may be beginning in understanding the Word of God. So Philip climbed up into the chariot and rode along with him. He explained to him that what he'd been reading in Isaiah was a prophecy of Jesus who'd been crucified. Then on another occasion, there was Cornelius the centurion. He needed help too. And God sent Peter to explain the scriptures to him and to his friends. Again and again, down through the centuries, God has sent help to those who sincerely desired to know the truth. And my friend, the same is true today. Not one person who earnestly and sincerely prays for an understanding of truth will be left without divine guidance. Why? How do I know that? Because Jesus said over here in John, John the seventh chapter and the seventeenth verse. Listen, John 7, 17. If any man is willing to do his will, he shall know of the teaching. You see, you've got to be willing. But if you're willing, then you'll know. God may send that assistance in a variety of ways you understand. He may speak through a sermon. It may be through a friend. It may be through a book. It may be a Bible course. It may be through a telecast like this that God will send you help. You see, that's the work to which it is written is committed. It's to bring truth to those who are praying for it. It's to give God's special message for this hour in its clearest, most attractive way possible, with God's help, of course, for no man could do that alone. I know that to be true. That's why we offer a free book at the conclusion of most of our telecasts. These books aren't written to entertain. These books are written to help people like you in understanding the scriptures. That's why, too, from the very inception of It Is Written, the It Is Written telecast, that we've sponsored various Bible study programs to help our viewers understand the Word of God personally, right in their own homes. We've offered streamlined, readable Bible study guides to help you in this. You see, those Bible study guides may have man's questions, but they have God's answers. And also that's why members of our staff come into as many areas as possible for a series of speaking appointments. And that's why we've developed the Revelation Seminar. I suppose this is the most exciting plan of all. I love it. It's an all-day session where viewers come together for eight hours of wonderful fellowship and study of the Word of God with members of my staff, and I'm there too, and a vegetarian meal thrown in. Be sure to watch for it in your area soon. God wants you to have help. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't understand the Scriptures, because you can. And listen, the Bible isn't a forbidding, frightening book filled with nothing but threats and warnings. Some people think that that's all it is. True, there are warnings there. But every one of them is born of divine love and compassion. And friends, you'll find Jesus there all the way through. It was Jesus himself who explained the scriptures to two of his disciples as they walked from Jerusalem to Emmaus on the day of his resurrection. Now, this is usually read on Easter, round Easter time, recorded here in Luke, the 24th chapter and the 27th verse. Listen. Beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. The things concerning himself in all the scriptures. And all he had was the Old Testament then. It's Jesus all the way through. Jesus all through the Old Testament. Jesus in the Gospels, Jesus in the letters of Paul, Jesus in the book of Revelation, and on the very last page of the Bible, 
The very last page of the Bible, Revelation 22, right here before it says the end, verse 17, the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. And let the one who's thirsty come. And let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost come too. If you're thirsty, that's the invitation. All the way through, the Bible is an invitation. All the way through, it's a demonstration of the incredible love of God for you and for me. It's a love that looked for us when we weren't looking for him. It's a love that found us when we didn't want to be found. It's a love that died to save us when we didn't know we were lost. When we neglect him, he still stays by. When we don't answer his invitation, he calls again. When we shun him on one road, he meets us on another. When we scorn him, he hurts. When we turn away, he weeps. When we drive the nails into his hands, he bleeds, but he keeps on loving anyway. We reject such love, my friend, only the peril of the life he wants to give us. Listen to this.
Thank you, Ben Parrish. Shall we pray? Father mine, we're simply overwhelmed when we think of the provision you've made to communicate with us. How could we see such love and not respond? Help us to stop short right now. Stop in the mad race and sit still and hear your voice and let it heal us. In the saving name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. Well, there's just time enough to tell you about our gift for you today. It's my book, Hammers in the Fire, and it's full of interesting, exciting information that the Bible is what it claims to be, the Word of God, evidence that it's true, that it's authentic, that you can count on every word of it. We'll tell you in a moment where to phone or write for your free copy. You'll find here the thrilling story of the Hittites, a people that critics said never existed. You read how the men with the spade keep digging up evidence that absolutely frustrates a man who doesn't want to believe. Evidence that Noah's flood really happened, and so much more. Ask for the book by name, Hammers in the Fire, so we'll know which one to send, and allow several weeks for delivery. Now here is the information you need. You may request Pastor Vandeman's free offer by writing directly to It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. The offer is sent by mail, free and postpaid. Could there be an easier address to remember? Just, It Is Written, Box O, that's simply Box Zero, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Please be sure to ask for the offer by name. While you're writing down the address, let me remind you to invite a friend to watch It Is Written with you next week on this station. The address again is It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Please mention the offer by name and write It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Hammers in the Fire is our book for today. Ask for it, won't you? Now the time has come all too quickly to say goodbye, everyone. But remember, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Thank you.